Would you take out um, your Bibles and turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 5, um, and then also take out um, your guide that will help you to follow along with today's teaching. It, the, the guide was sort of the jacket of what was handed to you as you came into the lobby. Um, and then uh, if you want to do this all electronically, you just go to viachurch.org slash guide. The scriptures will come up as well as this guide for teaching today. We're starting a brand new series for the summer called Kingdom People, and we're going to be looking at the Beatitudes, okay? The Beatitudes is coming from Matthew chapter 5. And uh, we've just wrapped up Exodus for almost a half, of year, half a year. We were going through the major themes of the book of Exodus. And you might go, wow, this is a total change of gears. But one of the things you're going to see is how tied together God's redemptive story really is. And I think you're going to just begin to smile as Exodus and all the, the study that we've done and what God's done in us is going to make Matthew chapter 5 really come alive to us. Uh, so you're going to need a Bible on your lap today. How many of you glad you go to a church you need a Bible? Okay, you need a Bible on your lap, have it on your lap throughout the entire teaching or, or your phone, and then uh, keep referring to that. And then if you don't have a Bible, just stop by the Information Center, and we'd love to get a Bible in your hand and make sure that you can read God's Word at home as well. So let's stand for the reading of God's Word. Matthew chapter 5, we're going to read the Beatitudes every single week for these next number of weeks. And so verses 1 through uh, 12... And uh, my Bible's just stuck together. Do you hear that? I don't know what that all is. There's no moisture here. I don't know what the deal is. But uh, we're going to read this each week. And I just really think um, that sort of the repetition over these next number of weeks, um, that maybe it would be more familiar to us and more powerful to us. And as we read through this the first time, there might be, might seem a little flat to you, but my prayer is over the next few weeks, as we sort of put flesh on these things, that the Beatitudes will just come alive in our lives. Seeing the crowds, he, Jesus, went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were, bo who were before you. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray together. We thank you for the power of your word. We now come, O oh God, asking that your word would do in our hearts and in our lives what only your word can do. Give us spiritual eyes to see, spiritual ears to hear. Soften our hearts, that our hearts may not be calloused and hardened, but soft and receptive to your word. Challenge areas in our lives, O oh God, that are not in the line with who you are and what you call us to be. Keep changing us, God. Keep shaping us. Keep forming us, oh God. So Lord, now, work your ways in us as we hear your word. And all of God's people said, amen, amen. Amen. Well, good morning, Via. You can be seated. It's good to see you this morning. And welcome to week one of Kingdom People an exploration of the Beatitudes. As we begin this sermon series, I'm very excited um, for this summer for us. My expectation, I think our expectation as your pastors and your leaders, is that this series would really seek to be a mirror for us as a church. What we're going to be going through here in a minute is a descriptor 
of a blessed community, of a community of God's people that he has shaped and formed. And so this summer has tremendous potential for you. But let me just warn you, this series may radically alter you in some ways. Be open and sensitive to the way that God's spirit, that God would want to work in your heart and in your mind through the course of these next few weeks. Uh, This is a little bit of a a dangerous series. Turn to your neighbor and say, this is going to get dangerous. (laughs) Yes. And any time we engage with God's word, um, we want to submit ourselves to it. And this is no exception. And so this is going to be a marvelous summer going through the Beatitudes. Um, As we enter into this series, one really important thing for us to do in order to go where Jesus is taking us with these statements is to really examine this word blessing or blessed or blessed. It's important for us to think about this word. I think when, when we think about this word, we think about what it is to be blessed, our mind goes to a lot of different places, doesn't it? Culturally, our mind goes to a lot of different places. If you were to say to someone just randomly, hey, what does it mean to be blessed? You'd probably get a host of answers. Uh, For some of us, a blessing is something that you say over a meal. Hey, who wants to say the blessing? I'll I'll say the blessing. Uh, Bless you is something you say when somebody sneezes. We say, bless you. Kind of strange, but we say it. I like to say gesundheit, which is a German word that means health. And just so like the Germans, just blunt and forthright when you sneeze, just to yell the word health at you. (laughs) Gesundheit. Some of us, when we think about blessing, we think about the stuff of our lives. We think of possessions. We think of uh, good parking spaces and uh, good sales at the grocery store and good price on a house. Uh, The things that we have in our possession, we think of the stuff that we get when we think of blessing. But Jesus is gonna take us to a very different place with these eight statements. And over the course of this summer, you may find that your definition of blessing and what it is to be blessed will change and shift dramatically. In our text for today, Jesus begins his most famous sermon, this discourse, it's actually several chapters long in the Gospel of Matthew, He begins this sermon by showing us what it really means to be blessed. And it's interesting. This is, uh, Rick alluded to it, but Matthew is the author of this account that we just read. And Matthew is writing to a Jewish audience who has the story of Israel, the story of God's people up until that point, very much in view. And he begins his section, this particular section, by telling us, that Jesus went up on the mountain. Now, we at Via Church, we have just gone through six months, as Rick said, of, of this series through Exodus. And let me just say this. I'm setting this up so that you can see this correlation. Here in this moment in Matthew, Matthew is writing to a Jew- Jewish audience, and he communicates about one that was sent by God who went up on a mountain to deliver a law or instruction to shape God's people. Does that sound familiar to you? Yes, it does, because that is an echo back to Moses, that God sent Moses years and years, hundreds of years before this moment that we're in in Matthew, hundreds and hundreds of years before, God sent Moses to go, and he actually ushered him up on the mountain, and he sent Moses with his law that would shape and transform his people and cause them to be a blessing to the nations around them. And so Matthew is showing us that Jesus, he's putting Jesus on display as the better Moses, with a better law. I'll say that again. Matthew is putting on display for us in this section that Jesus is the better Moses with a better law. And so how does this better law message begin? But it begins by Jesus describing for us what this gospel-shaped community looks like. And what does he say? He says this, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The first words out of his mouth are used to describe a community that's been shaped by God. And he says that this community are, first of all, poor in spirit. Now, 
famous preacher, Charles Spurgeon, he talks about this particular uh, blessed statement, poor in spirit, and he says it this way. If you're climbing a ladder, the first step is one of the most important steps. You go the first step, the second step, the third, the third step, and it's very intentional why Jesus put this as the first step, because it is the first place that we need to go in order to understand all the following blessed statements. And I think you'll see why as we approach the end of the sermon today. It's the first place that we need to go to understand what is to come. We won't know how to mourn rightly without understanding this. We won't know what it is to be really meek, a meek people, or hunger and thirst after righteousness until we first go to what it is to be poor in spirit. Spurgeon also says this particular blessed statement is like the soil that's laid out. So if you imagine this sermon series like a garden, today we're putting the soil down that all of the other statements will grow and emerge from. So what does this mean, poor in spirit? You and I might, might see this, and our minds might go instantly to think of those who are materially poor. That for some of you, we read that, and that might be just where you went. Um, those who don't have financial means. God cares deeply for the poor. We know this from Scripture. You look at the Old Testament. All throughout the Old Testament, he calls God's people to be a generous people and to care for those in their midst and to care for the poor, the outcast, the foreigner, the widows, the orphans. He calls his people to do that. But this phrase, poor in spirit, needs to do something different in our minds and hearts than simply state one who is financially struggling, okay? Okay? It is much more radical and much more far-reaching than that. But we will benefit for a moment as we think about this, if we think about someone who is materially poor. This is going to benefit us. Because one who is materially poor typically understands their dependence on others to a greater degree than those who aren't. So that's just a general principle that we can lay out there. Someone who's materially poor, they have a greater understanding of their dependence on others than those who are not materially poor. Now notice I didn't say they're more dependent on others than those who are materially wealthy. I said they understand their dependence on others. You and I are all dependents. We are all very much dependent on others. It's whether or not we understand and recognize and see our dependence on others. So this is going to be helpful for us. The posture of the materially poor is going to be very helpful for us in examining what it means to be poor in spirit. So today there's, there's four points today. And what I, I really, I think a helpful picture to think about is these four points are going to be four angles by which we, you and I, can look at what it means to be poor in spirit. So poor in spirit is very much going to be the focal point of today, but each of these four points is going to seek to explain and enhance what it means to be poor in spirit. And so let's engage with these together. So first of all, the poor in spirit, they do this. They associate, they identify with, they see themselves as the lowly. The poor in spirit associate as the lowly. The first thing we notice about Jesus' statement is that it is at the very least associating with the poor or with those in need, at the very least. You know, when you and I, when we envision a blessed life, as we said before, this is not the first place that our mind goes to. This is not the first thing that we think of. I mean, some of us in this room, man, we think of diamonds and Bentleys and, and who knows what. Turkish rugs, I don't know, whatever your thing is. We go all sorts of different places when we think about this, but Jesus takes us in and he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Poor in spirit associate with the lowly. Now, when you and I think about this, we think about, you might think about people like Mother Teresa in her life dedicating to the poor and the vulnerable. And for some of you, it's very difficult for you to envision what this would look like in your life. It's very hard for you to envision that kind of dedication, that kind of service. We'll just say this, though, that the degree to which you associate with the lowly, the degree to which you identify with or see yourself as 
the lowly is the degree to which you associate with Jesus. Now, that's quite a statement. Let's unpack that a little bit. Well, you think about Jesus. The prophet Isaiah describes Jesus as the one who was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows. He goes on to say, one from whom men would hide their faces. When we view this word, this phrase, poor in spirit, to many in that audience, Jesus' audience, that phrase would conjure up in their minds the image of a beggar. Somebody sitting on the side of the road, begging for loose change, begging for help. What do many of us do when we see someone begging? Some of us, we go out and we help. We come alongside. We ask them questions, maybe hear their story. Some of us, if we're honest, sometimes we walk by. Sometimes we even might even hide our face. You see this sometimes, you know, somebody on the side of the road and some people stop, help, and some people just keep looking ahead, almost not even acknowledging the presence of somebody. And this is a little bit of this descriptor of Jesus, like one from whom men would hide their face. Then you look at Jesus' example, so associating with the lowly. So that's what we're thinking about when we think about the poor in spirit. Now look at Jesus' example. He came And in his public ministry moment, the ministry moment of Jesus coming out and declaring who he was and what he was going to do, who does he associate with? This is one of the great scandals of Jesus' ministry, is that he hung out with tax collectors and sinners. That he was known through by the influential people of that day as a glutton and a drunkard. I mean, what if your pastors were known as gluttons and drunkards? <laughs> but yet, this is, this is who Jesus hung out with. Was he a glutton and a drunkard? No. But who did he associate himself with? The despised, the rejected, the marginalized sinners. He associated himself with them. And then, even beyond this, think about and think about associating with the lowly. Think about what God has done. We, we talk about the good news of Jesus. And Philippians 2, if, if you don't have time, just jot down Philippians 2. Read that chapter this week. Because in Philippians 2, we see that God actually came to us. God did not sit up in the heavens and look at us in our dismay and call out and just tell us what to do. Hey, fix yourself. Do this. God also didn't just reach in. We used to own a, an aquarium uh, 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 with saltwater fish, and sometimes it would get gross, and I would have to reach in. And you know how when you're reaching into something nasty, your face kind of contorts? Oh, man. Ugh. God didn't do that. He didn't just, oh, I suppose if I have to. God came down, and in the person of Jesus, he took on flesh, and he dwelt with us. You talk about associating with the lowly. We not only have an example from the prophet Isaiah of what that would look like, we not only have an indicator of what that looked like in Jesus' public ministry, but God himself came to you and I, the lowly, and put on flesh and dwelt with us. This is the God that we worship, and this is what the poor in spirit associate with. And so first of all, the poor in spirit, they associate with the lowly. We, as kingdom people, associate with the lowly. Second, the poor in spirit put their weakness on display. Um, As many of you know, in Arizona, Arizona has thousands of orphans in the care of the state. This is something that we've, we've brought to you several times. Just basically mean that there are, at any given time, thousands of, of kids um, who've been separated from their families due to a host of things, drug abuse, neglect, uh, domestic violence, a lot of different things. And at any given time, there's thousands of kids in the care of the state due to this. Via Church, along with many other churches in Arizona, have stepped up to say, We want to uh, reflect who God is in the midst of this need, and we want to come alongside, identify with, and and come under those who would need um, 
uh, a place to stay and a family to know what that looks like. One of the things we've learned, though, is that kids in, people just say, the system, uh, one of the things that you learn about kids in the system is the effect of trauma on the mind of a child. The effect of trauma on the mind of a child. This is massively significant to understanding behaviors in kids. With many kids who have experienced trauma, there's this natural tendency to put up walls or to try to project strength in many ways. When these kids, uh, when kids lose trust, one of the ways to deal with it is to not let anyone else in. And in the process, they lose the ability to express their thoughts and their feelings. Everything gets cloistered in like this. In essence, they hide their weakness so they won't be hurt anymore. Now, now you and I, let's back the picture up to a larger scale. You and I are just like this. We are kids of trauma in a cosmic sense. In the story of God, we see that we are created good, but we, through our first father, And mother, Adam and Eve, we chose to rebel against this good God, which led to separation and pain and struggle and hurt and heartache and trauma. And because of this, what do we do many times? We operate like kids who have experienced trauma. We too put up our walls of strength. We don't let anybody else in. We know our weaknesses, but are we going to let anybody know what our weaknesses are? No, we hold them very close to the vest because it's safe. It's comforting to do that, but in the process of that, we end up with destructive tendencies. We'd rather stay closed off. We become masters at deflecting attention away from our weakness and either on to something else or toward our own strength. We do this. There's a marvelous freedom that the poor in spirit have that Jesus is talking about, that kingdom people have, in that they are able to put their weakness on display. They're able to put their weakness out there for others to see. And I'll just say this, to the degree that you put your weakness on display, you show a power greater than yourself, and you provide an opportunity to boast not in your strength, but in God. To the degree that you do this, You provide an opportunity to brag on God and his strength. And so what does this look like? Well, many of us operate as if our weakness is a liability. Let me just say this line. This this might connect with some of you. Your weakness is actually one of your greatest gospel assets that you have. Your weakness may be one of your greatest gospel assets or something that you have because of the good news of Jesus. Now, this sounds strange. Some of you are giving me weird looks right now, and that's okay, because this sounds counterintuitive, but I'll give you two reasons why this is true. Two reasons why putting your weakness on display is worth it. The first one, whether you're a Christ follower or not, this is the first reason. It goes against the impulses of a broken system. The broken systems of the world that we live in and the way our world operates, it's going to go in a completely opposite direction direction. You know, our world is full of one-uppers. What's a one-upper? I just have to be one up on the next guy. I just have to do a little bit better than the next guy. I just have to show myself as a little bit stronger than the next person. As a Christ follower, we we can dump that and we can walk forward in freedom, putting our weakness on display because of the strength that's behind us. But even if you are not a Christ follower here, in a world of the white noise of one-uppers, you could actually live a little bit differently by putting your weakness on display. So number one, it's going to go against the grain of the broken systems of our world. And number two, it will likely cause others to wonder and even question about the strength that is under you or behind you. Um, if you guys have had a chance to go to any, any sort of famous tourist destinations, Hollywood or Vegas or anything like that, you've probably seen a street performer. There's several kind of iterations of this, of the street performer who's kind of magically sitting on air. I don't know if you've seen this, where they have like a staff or something that one hand is, is on, and then their feet are up and their other hand is up, and it looks like they're levitating. 
Now, many of you have seen this. Some of you are Googling right now. It's okay. <laughs> but why do they do they, All they do is they just sit there and they, and they levitate, right? And people gather around and they just stare at them. They look at them. And people stare at them because they're wondering why and how this person is able to stand up when they're, they're, they're just seemingly floating there. And so they're wondering, they're pondering. And many times, our life as a Christian looks a lot like this. It should cause people to wonder what is holding you up, what's, what's keeping you afloat, what is, what is the strength under this? Because I don't see necessarily strength from you, but I see a strength within you. The kingdom people operate as kingdom people because we, we operate within the cadence of a different kingdom. We operate within the joy of a liberated life. Kingdom people have been set free from bondage. They've experienced reconciliation with their father, and they know the joy of his presence. They're not only able to put their weakness on display, but they enthusiastically do so because to show their weakness is to brag on his strength. Now, you might be sitting here, and this might sound either theoretical or very unattainable for you. Can I just give you some helps right now? Some of you might be sitting here, and this is going to sound a tad promotional, but I assure you these are good things that you need to consider. Some of you are sitting here, and you've, your weakness that you think about has to do with a loss in your life, loss of a job, loss of a loved one, loss of some significant thing for you. And the way for you to put your weakness on display is actually to look at and put this loss in perspective. There's something that I want to encourage you towards. That's called grief recovery. This class exists to help you look at that fully. That might be some of you here, and you might really want to consider that. Some of you are sitting here, and your weakness has to do with an addiction in your life. You, many of you know where this is going. Some of you struggle with a constant addiction and you, and you fight and you fight, but no matter what you do in your own strength, you can't overcome this and you need to make Tuesday nights a part of your life, which are recovery groups, where people that struggle just like you put their weakness on display and go, God, would you show your strength through my weakness? Some of you need to do that. Or some of you sit here and you deal with, I'll just call it mission atrophy, Mission atrophy, where you sit in a service like this and you hear the, the, the clear directive of Scripture to live your life in the context of God's mission and every area of your life is all for Jesus, but then you walk out of these doors and you go, I have no clue what that looks like. I have no clue what that feels like. And I feel like I have no one in my life that is encouraging that for me. You need to invest yourself in community. You need to involve yourself with others who are living within that framework as well to say, God, what does it look like to put your mission forefront in my life? And the way we do that around here is through something called Via Communities. So those are just some very, very practical, I told you it would sound promotional, but they are good things that we believe will help to cultivate what it is for you to be poor in spirit and to help you to put your weakness on display in your life. So how are you doing this? I want to encourage you towards that. How are you putting your weakness on display? To the degree that you put your weakness on display, I'll say this again, you show a power greater than yourself, and you provide an opportunity to boast, not in your strength, but in God. So the poor in spirit put their weakness on display. Because they do this, thirdly, the poor in spirit have what I call a courageous dependence. Let's think about courage for a minute. Many of us in this room have courage. Where do we get courage? Where do we find courage? For some of us, we look inside. This is who I am. This is what I have. And we get courage that way. For some of us, we look to outside things. For some of us, we get courage by knowing we have a certain position. Maybe it's an employment position or a position within our family. For some of us, we get courage by knowing that things are the way they need to be in this area of my life, and we have courage from that. We draw courage from other things. 
Can I just tell you that this type of courage that I just described, both of those types are completely conditional. They're completely conditioned on the state of those things. If your courage is in your mental capacity, what do you do when you have a stroke and you lose mental capacity? If your courage is in your physical prowess, what do you do when you suffer a debilitating loss and no longer have the physical prowess that you once had? If your courage is in your position at work, what do you do when you lose that job? What does true courage look like? The poor in spirit show us what true courage looks like. The courage of the poor in spirit is, now notice this, it's not inside courage. I think I'm smart enough, I'm strong enough. It's not an outside things courage. I have position, wealth, status, etc. That's not the courage that we're talking about here. So where does this type of courage come from? Or in other words, where does true courage come from? Well, it has to come from a source that doesn't change, right? It has to come from something that's not movable, unshakable. It has to come from something that's all powerful for you to fully be able to have courage in it. It has to, additionally, your source has to be all knowing. There can't be any surprises. In other words, the source of your courage has to be a source that will never let you down, a source that will never fail you, a source that will always be there that is what he says. This type of courage can only come from one place, from the unchanging, the all-powerful, the all-knowing one. This type of courage can only come from God. There's a, uh, a clip that's going around now on social media. I've seen it several times. And it's this clip of this bear cub. And some of you have seen it, this bear cub that is running away from a mountain lion that is sizably larger. And this, it's like a three-minute clip. And the whole time, this, this bear cub just barely evades this mountain lion who is just ready to grasp it and kill it and, and, and probably eat it. Uh, some of you struggled to hear that. It's okay. But this bear cub just, just, just barely escapes. And in the last moments, the, the cub gets on, it swims across this river, and it, it plants itself down. It turns and it looks at the mountain lion and it begins to call out, begins to, to roar in a bear cub roar at this mountain lion. The mountain lion comes and takes a swipe at it, you know, and they're in this confrontation. The bear cub continues to roar. And all of a sudden, the mountain lion turns around and begins to run away. And those of you who've seen the clip know why. It's because at this moment, the, the camera begins to shift. And behind the bear cub, we see this ginormous mother grizzly bear on her hind legs, roaring. Right? This is a lot of times what our courage looks like. Your courage, if it's to mean anything, if it's to be true, can't depend on you. It has to depend on one that will never let you down, will never fail you, will never leave you high and dry. So where is your courage? Does it come from your dependence on God? Because that is where the courage of the poor in spirit comes from, is from their dependence on God. Finally, the poor in spirit, they view themselves primarily as receivers, not achievers. Some of you balk at this a little bit. You're looking at this a little skeptically. What do you mean by this? Receivers, not achievers. Some of you, because some of you in this room are achievers. Just be honest, okay? Some of you are achievers in this place. You're productive people. You like to get the job done. You like to have a task list and boom, 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 boom. I did it. Stamp, done, good to go, right? Let me just say this to ease you a little bit because some of you are gearing up for some guilt. I can just tell. Don't feel guilty, Okay? Your, your achieving is a part of the way God wired you. You shouldn't feel guilty for that. But you should know this, that in even your achieving, do you recognize that every single aspect of your ability to achieve comes from something you have received? Do you recognize that? Every single aspect of your ability to achieve comes from something you have Received. That kind of rhymed. It's a little cheesy, but it's true. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 4, 
he asks this rhetorical question. He says this, he says, what do you have that you did not receive? Now, for some of you right now, this question needs to be on your mirror in your bathroom. This question needs to be in your car. You write it down, you put it in your car. This question needs to be on your desk at work. It needs to be in your wallet every time you grab your credit card or your cash. This phrase needs to appear in your life on a regular basis because it is worthy of reminder. What do you have that you didn't receive? To which the rhetorical question answers itself as nothing. Nothing you have do you have because of yourself. Everything you have has been given to you. Why is this important for us to remind ourselves of? Because of our tendency to boast in our achievements. What does Paul say in the very next line? He says, if then you have received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? If you've received everything, why do you boast as if you hadn't received it? See, Paul is trying to protect this church, and I believe us, from something very destructive, which is the tendency to center our lives around us, to center everything in our life around us. And if that's you this morning, if you'd say, I do have that tendency, I do see that I tend to soak up the praise and the acclaim and the glory a lot, if that's you, be warned by this. That path is going to lead to two places, both of which are destructive. If you're boasting in your achievements, number one, if you achieve great things, where does your boast go? Right to you. Leading to what? Pride. Leading to what? Further separation from the God who has bestowed on you every blessing that you have, every single thing that you have. Is that a good path? That's, no, that's not a good path. That's not a good path. The second place that that will lead you is if you get into the point in life where you realize, I have not achieved what I hoped to have achieved by this point in my life. You buy a red convertible, right? You do a lot of weird things. You despair in yourself, in other words, because you haven't achieved what you hoped you would achieve because it was all dependent on you because the entire aim and focus was completely on you. Either way, your hope was in you and you did not remind yourself that every single thing that you have has been given to you. That you are, when we think about the poor in spirit, the stamp on the life of the poor in spirit is recipient, receiver. That is the primary stamp on us. We are receivers. Kingdom people look dramatically different because kingdom people are a people who boast not in themselves, but in the one who is truly worthy of their boasting. Truly worthy of their boasting. So the poor in spirit, as we've seen, the poor in spirit, they associate with the lowly. They, they put their weakness on display so God's strength might be seen. They have a courageous dependence that causes people to look and to wonder what is holding you up? What is your strength? And kingdom people, the poor in spirit, they recognize themselves primarily as receivers, not achievers. Blessed, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now all these things are evidences of the poor in spirit and they all stem from a new heart with new affections. And this work is a work that God does. It's a radical work that God does in us, where he reveals the goodness, the truth, and the beauty of Jesus to us. And in this good news that we love to proclaim it via, in this gospel message that we love to live into and saturate ourselves with, we clearly see that that we are poor in spirit. We have nothing to offer God, and yet God has lowered himself to come to us and to give himself for us. We at Via, we here are shaped by this reality, and in this we are, as Jesus said, we are blessed beyond belief. Let's pray this morning.
God, we once again remind ourselves that everything we have, everything that we have has been given to us. We remind ourselves that we are the lowly, we are the beggar. So God, would you do your work in us now as we continue to reflect on your word, as we continue to reflect on this truth of what it is to be poor in spirit and what the poor in spirit look like. God, may you once again give us a courage that depends not on us and our abilities. It depends not on anything else that is created, but is connected and dependent wholly on you. Would you help us in this courage to be able to put our weakness on display, to put ourselves, our fallenness, our brokenness on display so that you might receive glory, so that your strength might shine through, so that you may be seen. God, we love you. We thank you. We give you praise for what you have done. And we stand in awe this morning at the work that you're doing in us and the work that you do through us. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. God, we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. Well, at this point, we have the Lord's Supper on either side of me here in, in a moment. We're going to come during this next song. And if you're here and your trust and your faith is in Jesus, you're invited to participate in communion with us. You don't have to be a member of VIA. All that we ask is that your dependence is in Christ and what he's done for you. If that's not you, if you're sitting here and you would say, I've heard the message this morning. I've heard about this courageous dependence. Some of this sounds scary, but I, I really sense that my faith needs to be in something better and stronger than me. I want to invite you to speak to one of our pastors who are going to be on either side and they'd love to talk to you about this good news story as we come and take of communion if that's you come and find one of them on the side and they would love to share with you what it looks like to really put your faith and trust in Jesus but for those of us that are going to be receiving these emblems I want to remind us of the famous last words of Martin Luther Martin Luther, who was a great Protestant reformer this year, we're celebrating the 500 year anniversary of the Reformation. This moment where the church said, we need to be faithful to what faith looks like. Faithful to this good news message. And Martin Luther, in his dying breath, said these words, we are beggars, this is true. We are beggars, this is true. And so as we come to the table, let's remind ourselves that we have nothing to offer, but everything that we have has been graciously bestowed on us as we receive these elements together at VIA. So would you come and would you receive these elements?